Welcome everybody. It's good to see everyone here. This is the economics of agricultural conservation practices. Uh, this, my name is Marcel Lewandowski. I'm with the University of Minnesota Water Resources Center. Uh, you'll notice the subhead here is how to talk to farmers about it. And we know a lot of you have experience working with farmers, speaking to farmers. So we invite you and welcome you to add comments and questions to the chat. Uh, there are a lot of people in this group, so please stay muted. Uh, uh, though we may invite you to uh, uh, unmute and speak up if we need some clarification on your comments. So myself with Dr. Anna Cates, who's also with the University of Minnesota, uh, Department of Soil, Water and Climate, uh, the two of us coordinated the development of this, this training webinar, but it's part of a, a larger project that um, funded with the North Central Region, SARE. And the, this larger project is led by the University of Minnesota, or the University of Wisconsin, excuse me, Extension. Uh, Jenny Seifert in, in particular has been leading this project. Uh, also, the partners on this project are the Environmental Defense Fund, Compere Financial, and the Croatan Institute. So we've been really happy to work with this group on this project. Uh, let's see, our, so our goal today is to help you understand the ways that conservation practices fit in farm budgets, and there's four modules of content. Today we'll be covering these first two, the Conservation 101 and the Landowner Tenant uh, Considerations, and then on Wednesday morning, We'll talk about the farm economics of conservation and more about working with farmers. Uh, but before we get into that, we'd like to open two polls for you to find out who is in the room. Uh, Jenny, do you mind starting with that first one? Just to find out the professional uh, affiliations here. Our target audience for this particular a pair of webinars is farm business management educators. So we expect that you're familiar with and comfortable with the finance part of this, but maybe a little less familiar with the conservation part. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. That'd be great and share results here. Looks like half of you are with research and educational institutions, another uh, one fifth with state and federal government, few from local government, uh, nonprofits, and other, including someone from Austin, Texas, Benefit Court Marketplace Ministry. Thank you for joining us. See, are, are, let's see, are you, do I have to click share results here? Oh, do you start, you still want to um, up? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, if you want to share the second poll. Okay. And this is two questions just to check. How confident are you about talking about uh, soil conservation topics? and then with farm finance topics. Okay, this is kind of what we expected. It was, it was somewhat confident about talking about soil conservation and uh, more of you are uh, very comfortable talking about farm finance topics. So that's about what we were expecting. So 
in a minute, what do we have? About 80% participation. Looks like people are slowing down. If you want to share that, Jenny, so people can see the results. And then the next thing we want to do is do just a real quick speed networking breakout here so you can meet some of these people that are in the room with you. Uh, we're going to, Jenny is going to invite you into a small breakout room for a few minutes. If you would just introduce yourself to the other folks in the room, describe what work you do related to farm business management or conservation. So we'll give you about five minutes to do that, and then we'll come back and get started on the presentations. All right, I am going to send folks to the breakout room is right now. So if you're if you haven't um, uh, joined your breakout room, I definitely encourage you to do so, so that you can meet the folks. I have a couple of rooms where um, the folks haven't joined yet.
Welcome back, everyone. We're, I think just a, a few folks we're still waiting on. Oh, Marcel, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Jenny. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I have one little sidetrack to do here uh, to explain why it is that we're not including ecosystem service markets or carbon markets in our considerations of this whole fine farm finance and conservation topic. Uh, the, the short answer is we just don't know enough about how this will play out. There's a lot of companies have promised to buy credits and several are offering contracts to farmers, but many questions remain about how the different practices will generate uh, credits in the different contexts. So it's kind of impossible to estimate uh, what revenue it'll uh, generate. Uh, these contracts vary in their length and their verification process, uh, how the management data is collected, what practices are eligible, what lands are eligible, the price, and so on. So there's a lot of, a lot of variables. Um, typically, these contracts are considering practices like no-till and cover crops and managed grazing. Uh, but we'll, we'll note that the perennial grasslands are really much more likely to actually sequester meaningful amounts of soil carbon, more so than the cropland practices in the Midwest. So on this slide, and actually also in your agenda, I uh, added these links. There's a couple of resources that go into more detail on this topic that I highly, highly recommend if you need to be uh, learning more about it. The Iowa State University document is a little older, but it has a real good comparison table. And the second, uh, reference there is from the Farmers Legal Action Group and Minnesota Farmers Union. It just came out last fall and talks about contract issues, sort of more the legal uh, end of this from a farmer's perspective. Uh, so both of these are, are quite useful. All right. Well, with, after that brief detour back to our regularly scheduled programming, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Serge Koenig from Sauk Soil Conservation District in Wisconsin. And Serge, if you could take a minute to just introduce yourself a little bit and, and the kind of work you do so people know where you're coming from. And he's gonna share his screen and talk about Conservation 101. Okay, how does it, is it coming through okay? That looks great. Okay. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Serge Koenig. I work for Sauk County Land Resources and Environment. Um, it's basically a, a county conservation department is what it is. We've been renamed about five times in the last 15 years. Um, so my role here is a conservation technician. And um, I've been in this role actually for 28 years now. And I have no, no need to go further up. I enjoy the technician role. I enjoy my interactions with farmers. Um, and I enjoy the interpersonal relationship building part of my job. Um, and that's awfully important. But I think what I've picked up the last five or six years is I also need to become more uh, knowledgeable when it comes to farm finance and economics. And so that has been somewhat challenging in a sense that that's not what I went to school for. And that's not what my interest is, but that's what I need to do. I figured out that that's what I needed to do in order to be more effective at the work that I do. Um, 
if I just stayed at the conservation level, like, yep, this is good for the soil, this is good for the birds, this is good for the water, I would get a few nibbles as far as like moving people towards conservation, but it was in it wasn't significant enough to make much of a difference. But when I led with the financial aspect of things and how much we could make or lose adopting a certain enterprise, then it seemed like it got people's attention just a little bit more. And just as an example, um, so managed rotational grazing, obviously just leaving our lands in perennial grasslands and a legume mix and having having our animals graze upon it um, just the way nature intended it to be. And that's the way it had been for eons. Kind of reverting back to that, uh, it's something that I've been interested in for forever. And I would say for the first 20 years of my career, you know, I advocated for it. And I would maybe, we we might average literally zero to 10 acres a year converted to grazing. And what I, re I think I kind of picked it up after a while. It's like, you know, why am I having such a hard time convincing people that this is a good idea, that grazing is a good idea? Well, the question always came back to, well, how does that pay the bills? <laughs> and my answer to myself was, um, I don't know. And so that's why I decided to go down this rabbit hole. And Paul Dittman was an ag lender and was an extension agent here in our county. It's really, really good with the numbers. And I just asked him to help me with this part of it. And it took a it took a few months to kind of get my feet under me when it comes to managing some of these things. And of course, for my own family, I do the financial part of day-to-day -day life. And so I think that helped a little bit too, but the farm finance piece was just intimidating. And so just over time, I, I got more comfortable with it and we developed a, just a simple spreadsheet um, determining the economic impacts of like converting to grazing for a farm, you know, running that enterprise, basically a simple enterprise budget calculator spreadsheet. And so we went from zero to 10 acres a year <clears throat> to 600 acres. The very first year I brought up finances first. And then the conservation came along for a ride. Um, never really brought up the conservation piece but I brought up the finances first. And so 600, we go from zero basically to 600 acres. That's when I knew that, okay, this is it. <clears throat> this has been the missing piece. And, and I started just diving into it more, you know, reading books and watching webinars and reading articles and, and just being really interested so that I could talk to talk a little bit. I mean, it's not still not my training and I don't pretend to be you know, knowledgeable, like completely knowledgeable with it, but it's not foreign anymore. And so, and then I think the following year we put in 800 acres and then the following we put in a thousand acres of grazing. It just in one county, just in my county. And I think this year we have another 600 acres going in and I have on the books for next year, another five, 600 acres. And it's all the finance is really, I've also gotten better at selling it to and the interpersonal skills, obviously, that matter an awful lot, too, because it doesn't matter what you know. You can't convey it. It doesn't get you very far. And so when it comes to just conservation practices in general, I think that's the piece that we as conservationists have been missing. You know, we just have not learned and gotten comfortable with running financial just looking at basic finance stuff with farmers and, and talking that talk a little bit more because that seems to get people's attention. So, uh, you know, based on that previous survey that Jenny had sent out, it a lot of you know that aspect of it, but maybe the conservation piece is where I, I come in here today and just 
to give you a little bit better background on what these conservation practices are that I deal with on a daily basis that I approach farmers about on a daily basis. Um, and so here we go. Um, let me see what we can do here. Okay, so a lot of you have seen this image probably before. This was, these were the dust storms of the 1930s um, before a lot of conservation practices were installed. And so the dust storms were, they would reach all, the, it's, it reminds me of what's happening right now with the Canadian wildfires, but it was much worse is that these are dust particles that you're inhaling. I wonder what impact that had on people back then, but it couldn't have been very, it uh, couldn't have been too good. Um, the, the one thing that I would say though is, so this is the 1930s, but my parents live in central Wisconsin, in Stevens Point area. Oh, and that's a glacial outwash area. It's very flat, sandy, um, heavily egged. And we still see this every spring. I mean, we have to, they kind of sometimes have to rinse their house, the side of their house because of the dust storms that are blowing off of our fields. And so as much as we've progressed in the conservation field, we're still stuck with some of this, of these things. And it's a challenge for folks like us in the conservation field to overcome some of it. So obviously, uh, mismanagement of our lands leads to this. That's that's the only reason this happens because we're mismanaging the land. And obviously that's not good for anything. It's not good for the farmer's profitability because that dust is, that's their profit margin right there. Um, all the important and nutritious soil is blowing in the wind. Um, and so that isn't good for them either, but it's certainly not good for the rest of us. And so there's also just severe soil erosion too that happened during that time. And I monitor our streams in Sauk County for the last probably 25 years, um, collect water samples, collect macroinvertebrates, which are insects that live a part of their life in the water. And they're like canaries in a coal mine based on what we find. That's how we know how clean or dirty the water is. So. We also analyze the water for phosphorus and nitrates and pH and sediment. And there's all kinds of different things that we're, and sometimes we'll get Wisconsin DNR to come out and they do fish shocking. And so really trying to get a, an assessment of the health of our streams and our lakes. And, um, and again, it's really, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see where the problem is coming from. I mean, if you if you can be a bird looking down upon our landscape, most of it's agriculture and ag land. And oftentimes it's bare for months and months of, at a time. And that's totally not natural. Um, and so you add a raindrop impact to that and we have runoff. And so, and there's part of our state over Door County area by Lake Michigan, we have karst topography, which is ba basically dolomitic limestone that has dissolved over eons of water percolating through it. So there, there are direct conduits then. So like the mismanagement on top of the ground is leading to, ero to I would say, pollution of our groundwater. And they can't drink their groundwater in a lot of places over there. And again, we know where that's coming from. And um, so if it's leaving the soil and it's leaving the cropland, it's going someplace and causing problems, it's also leaving our farmers less profitable. And I don't know that that connection's always made by our landowners. And so, I mean, that's the part that the people like me try to remind them gently as possible. No one likes to be accused of anything. And I, and I get that, I don't like that either. And so, trying to be sensitive to, to that as we work with farmers. Um, it goes a long ways. So that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to protect, and you know, we're, we're trying to protect the farmers, but we're trying to protect us too, because we use everything. And 
sometimes if I get some pushback, I'm going off a little bit here, but what I, what I would say is like, you know, what would be nice is if somebody invented a bubble, like a glass bubble so that your farm could be completely contained and you can do whatever you want with it. You can rip up your soil, you can have it blow away, you can pollute your groundwater, you can pollute your surface water, you can pollute the air that you're in and you just get to live with that and that's yours. And that's great. I, I wish someone could come up with that um, because then it really wouldn't matter what you did to your land because it wouldn't affect anybody else. But until we invent something like that, we're kind of responsible for each other, whether we like it or not. And so what can we do in the process? Well, let's adopt some conservation practices. Well, what are some of those practices? Well, we could do some infield practices. And again, like, like I mentioned, well-managed pasture to me is the gold standard um, because reduced no reduced tillage, it's still tillage. And no-till is great. And that's what we definitely push for that. Um, but oftentimes we're no-tilling crops like corn and soybeans and the like. And that comes with it some problems. That has some problems with it, but obviously we we have some people aren't interested in animals. And so then we go down this rabbit hole and try to find a way to make that profitable, reduce your tillage, reduce inputs. Um, how, how do we find cheaper seed that maybe doesn't produce as much, but has a, a greater return on investment? Uh, what about cover crops? How do we make those work? Do they pay for themselves? Do they pay for themselves this year? Maybe not. But within three or four years, in all likelihood, they do. That's what the data shows anyway. So we run through those numbers. Uh, crop rotations. Do we just take it one year at a time? The newer thing that I think we're approaching is perhaps we we um, we look at four or five years. And what does, is it profitable over four or five years? Because if we're just looking at a snapshot in time year per year, Sometimes those cover crops don't pan out. It doesn't look like it's making a difference or the crop rotations don't look like it's making a difference. But when you average them out, it's like, wow, okay. They actually do make a difference. Um, and some of the other practices, edge of field practices, obviously if we've got a big ditch in your field, we'll need to fix that somehow so that you don't break an axle, um, so that you don't have to drive around it. So, you know, putting in things like grass waterways, grade stabilization structures. We also look at manure storage. Um, and that's one that I know landowners definitely like that. I, I'm doing less and less of those, I would say. It's very expensive. Um, and we're just losing our dairy farmers in Wisconsin. We're losing hundreds and hundreds per year over the last decade or so. And so, just not quite the push. So when I started almost 30 years ago, it seemed like about every couple of miles there was a dairy farm and now it's nowhere near that. And so, and along with that, there's a lot of psychological toll too, um, whether it's suicides or depression, or I mean, all those things come along with it, unfortunately. Um, so edge of field also, wetland restoration could be in the field, I've done plenty of those practices too, or stream bank management. So we've exacerbated the runoff coming from our uplands because we've mismanaged that land. And so instead of the water soaking into the ground, water is running off. So we get a flood of water rushing off the landscape into our stream corridors, and then our streams flash flood. And all that energy then causes erosion problems in the stream banks. And so we come in and pull the banks back and put some riprap in. But again, that's really pretty reactive. That's a reactive way of attacking the problem. We want to be proactive is in the field. That's by far the most effective way. Once it gets to the stream, we've kind of lost the battle, really. Now we're just creating the symptom of the problem. So pasture management, you heard me talk about that. Reduced no-till residue management, you know, so, you know, we try to 
encourage our farmers to adopt the soil health practices. And, you know, one of which is keep a living root in the soil at all times, 24-7, 365, as much as you possibly can. And so you would wonder, well, how, how does that work in the Midwest? You guys have winter. That's true. That's why we put in cover crops. And the cover crops, ideally, some of those cover crops carry over into the winter. And based this a lot, there's a lot of studies that show that that's if there's a living root in the soil, that's soil, the organisms in the soil are still alive. And what really the whole intent behind that is if we have a living root, the organism, we're talking about bacteria, fungus, nematodes, the whole nine yards, they are reliant on the sugars. They're addicted to sugar. And the sugar comes in the form of photosynthesis. And that's the synthesis basically of carbon molecules, CO2 out of the atmosphere, added with some water linked together with the sun's rays in the form of, in the process of photosynthesis, locking like in the carbon molecules together, which in essence, which really is sugar glucose, that then is taken to the roots. And if the plant makes 100 units of N or sugars, it gives up 40 to 50 units of it into the soil for the soil organisms. And it's a symbiotic relationship that's evolved over millions of years, obviously. And so um, the plant is actually feeding the soil organisms. So that soil, you, the biggest concept, and I think the most effective way to teach soil health to our farmers is like to realize that that soil is alive and there's a lot of living things there. So if you take a teaspoon of healthy soil, there are more organisms in that teaspoon than there are people on earth right now, a lot more. And so those organisms need to be fed and they need to be nourished, and they need to be protected, and they need to be watered. And so how do we do that? Well, we keep a living root in the soil at all times. And that they, they feed off of the sugars from that. That's what was here naturally, right? Where what we're doing with crops is completely unnatural to the way nature works. And then the one of the other principles is keep the soil covered. It's like, they, we don't want the soil bare and naked. We need it covered. It needs to have a, a, a clothing over it, a skin over it. Um, and that's what residue does. And then the other one is diversity. It's like, we don't want to eat, can't eat hamburgers every day for every meal. Um, and just like them, they, they need a diversity of, of just food. You know, it, it, it feeds different organisms in the soil. And so, well, how do you do that if you have a monoculture of beans, like you see in this picture, or corn? Why well, you plant a cover crop that's a diverse array that kind of covers that up a little bit, or some people intercrop, and so that that helps with that too. Um, and the other one is limit 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 disturbance, meaning don't till the soil. These organisms, it's kind of like you build your house, and a tornado goes through, rips it down in a form of tillage, and then you have to rebuild your house, and a year later, a tornado comes through and rips stuff. And, and see, that's not conducive to life and to health, obviously. And so a lot of these organisms, they talk to each other. And mycorrhizae fungi, well, you know, they've done tests where they'll stress a plant 50 feet away, and there's a reaction 50 feet over. They're like, how did that happen? It's mycorrhizae fungi. And so when we go through until we're ripping those communication lines. And so there's quite, so this is, this is the one thing that I really try to get across our farmers is that soil is alive. And when you treat it that way, it will, it will reciprocate. Um, it will help you out in the long run. And, and you treat it when you, when you're treating something that's alive, you also respect it a little more and you're more sensitive to it. And in doing that, it's symbiotic. You take care of it and it'll take care of you type of thing. And so these are the kind of things that we try to work uh, with our farmers on. Cover crops, um, roots, the role of roots in the soil. And when you see that these roots that I'm holding here, um, you just think those that's carbon. 
that's sugar and that's feeding organisms and those organisms are literally within a few millimeters of these all these roots that's where they reside crop rotations again part of the crop rotation is breaking pest cycles um, but the other part is is like i say providing a different food array for our organisms that are living in the soil so how to implement new systems so there there are definitely farmers over the last 30 years that I've worked with that are pretty successful. It's and it's <laughs> as you all know, most of life is right here. And so when this is right, it seems like we can kind of make things work. You're more resilient. You don't give up. You're patient. You're inquisitive. Um, you stay with it. You see, all those things are mental characteristics, right? So like. That is the biggest challenge. And it's not just for farms, it's for all of us. And I'm included in that. And so I'm implicating myself when I say this, but like there are these characteristics like, can you trust people? Um that, that you have to believe that that implementing the, this practice is good for you. What's the risk? I don't want to lose the farm on it. Okay, experiment on 10 acres. Let's see how that goes. Expand it to 20. Go to 100. If it's working well, put the whole farm in, as in no-till, cover crops, crop rotations, or grazing. You know, I've I've got some farms now that have that started out with 20 acres of rotational grazing, and they have 400 acres now, and that's their whole farm is in that. There's one next year that we're close to implementing and signing up. It's 470 acres of grazing. The whole farm is going in, um, and then financial stability, um, and then obviously their stewardship values. So this is where a little bit of financial help on our end helps, or we can send them to people like yourselves and to help hopefully convince them and take away some of those risks. Uh, perceive risks, but there are some risks for sure. But like I said, a lot of it's up here. And so, well, grazing would never work. Well, have you tried it? No. Uh, let me show you someone where it does work. Well, not on my soil. Well, here's another soil that looks like it. Well, that's too much work. Well, here's a way to open up the gates automatically. Okay. Well, it's not profitable. Well, here are the numbers. See, so I'm always looking to like figure out like what it is that that's holding them up. And and it's mental. Mostly it's mental, I would say. Um, not all the time. I'm not trying to oversimplify, but you know how it is. Uh, None of us like to change that much, and that's mental. So who can provide technical assistance and funding to farmers? Um, so most of you, this is their nationwide Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, NRCS. They have different programs and technicians available to soil conservationists available to help assist with things. Now in, in Wisconsin, Almost every county has conservation staff. And so we're funded by the county and by the state, but we're located within the counties. And so that's that's what I am. Um, I am that person um, for our county. Uh, state, obviously, we have state agencies. We have private nonprofit organizations, too, that do that. Um, hold on a minute. I. I, I need to close my window. <laughs> it's a bit loud outside, sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so what's our role? Well, oftentimes um, we are, we're just helping farmers through what it is that what it, what 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 their perceived problems are. Like as far as like, boy, I have a a big ditch in the field. Can you come out and look at this? And that's an obvious one. Um, so how do farmers do it? A lot, lots of times we're we're getting a phone call, or I'm making a cold stop, or I'm calling somebody if I see something, say from the road. Or something like that, but but just 
looking looking us up um conservation programs or conservation offices or something like that nrcs that's a good place to start and oftentimes then you know we we meet on the farm and we talk through what what they're seeing and what they would like help with and then i try to match up what they're doing with um you know i'm trying to match up like okay is that really a problem and if so is this really the solution for it or should we just change enterprises all together and that would solve it and so part of that just comes from experience you know, if a new person comes out it's a little bit different but if someone who has been out there for 30 years like myself if i show up it's it's a little bit different i've just seen enough things now to make to make maybe slightly better decision but not necessarily always um so ask about the different programs there are different cost share rates there are like some of the nrcs practices like say for rotational grazing they just pay a flat rate so like for fencing uh i don't know what the latest so it's a dollar fifty or something like that per foot um and if you can find someone to install it using the standards and specs which is not that hard uh, if you can find someone to install it for a buck 40 well you came out ahead and sometimes that happens um and but sometimes how the programs work is we pay 70 percent. so if the program costs so you put in a grass water waterway and it costs ten thousand dollars you have to come up with 30 with three thousand and we'll come up with seven and so that's how some of those sometimes it's just 50 percent, but like in our county oftentimes it's it's either a flat rate or about 70 percent cost sharing um but then there are things there are definitely restrictions you know so if you put in say if we convert the land to grazing well that means we have to install fencing and we have to put in water lines and we have to seed it down and so the big thing is like the maintenance period on those like sometimes it's 10 years and sometimes it's 20 years meaning don't rip out the fence we took cost share we took taxpayer dollars to install a practice to help solve a water quality problem that helps everyone we can't rip those out within two years because well I changed my mind that isn't how that works and so I'm pretty clear about that like okay here are the restrictions so I wouldn't do this unless you you want to do this and you better be you just need to be sure let's run through the finances make sure it makes economical sense let's go through your values what your goals are for your farm what is it that make you tick what makes you happy and if these are the if these things match up well then a maintenance period of 10 years or whatever isn't really the issue right if you're gonna if you mean to do it then let's go for it obviously if something really catastrophic happens there are wiggle room out of these things that isn't an issue um but oftentimes they don't really see that i mean people are when they're convinced of doing something they're following up on it um so yeah we just want to make sure that the program is obviously a fit for the problem and goals i mentioned that earlier already um i just give you an example of that um I approached the farmer approached me said hey I want to put in a stream crossing surge I'm like okay so came out started the design did the survey and, and I thought you know this guy seems to really like animals he had um, a herd of Herefords and um and he's kind of overgrazing some of these pastures are where we want to put this crossing in and I thought let me just approach him um and and just talk about like well should we, what would you think about managed rotational grazing and and if we did that a certain way you wouldn't probably need this crossing how about I draw something up for you and we can run through the finances together to see if it even makes any sense and I'll give you a proposal of what the layout would be like and what the animal numbers would be and then what the financial impact of that would be and would you be okay with that I said you can tell me to get lost afterwards it doesn't matter it, it's but I thought I should at least let's would you be okay exploring that option and the answer was yes and so we did and 
we never ended up putting in the stream crossing. We converted, I think he ended up putting in 450 acres, this whole farm into rotational grazing um, as a result of that. And so that's the enterprise budgeting. And sometimes it's just, it doesn't, you know, you're, you're picking the wrong enterprise to solve a problem. And maybe if we're switching enterprises would solve that problem um, much easier. And so then we have to step in as you folks or conservation folks and, and try to work through if that fits their long-term goals and answers their why. Like, why are you farming? Why are you doing any of this? Um, should you be working in town? Maybe it's better to rent the ground out and do something else. I don't know. But if, it, if this fits your why, let's see if we can pursue it. So technical assistance, um, this is just, this is my role and our role, you know, to see if they're eligible for the different enterprises or practices. And even if there isn't, con even if we don't offer cost sharing, and I've done this a few times too, where people aren't interested in the cost sharing, but they would take the advice, though they would take the technical assistance in designing or laying something out. I'm happy to do that. I tell you what, it's, makes my job easier if we don't have to deal with those the financial aspect of it is like oh here you go here's a plan go nuts you know or here's how i would do it you go ahead and do it how you want but this is how i would do it this is what we found to work really well thank you for the advice i'll see you later uh, you know and then i mentioned like hey if you need help during installation let us know i can help lay it out for you whatever but that's kind of our role is to kind of walk people through that. There's the gentleman here you see on the screen is Roman Miller. And um, he, you know, he was one that it took me a good five years to convince him to adopt managed rotational grazing on his farm. Um, every year, you know, we talk about it friendly enough and everything was fine. Um, and then the one year I got my training in, in running financial enterprise budgets. And I ran that by him and said, well, here's what the corn is bringing in and here's what grazing could bring in. And literally what took me five years to convince him of took 20 minutes because he left my office and before he even got home, he called me and said, hey, let's put the whole farm in, which was 230 acres, which is everything he had, including the neighbors. So it's, quite a big leap, but that's that's the uh, advantage of using the finances. And I'm convinced of it now. I mean, I, it's what I tell young uh, up and coming conservation staff as much as I can is like, don't ignore the financial aspect of any of this stuff because that's really how it moves forward. That and interpersonal skills. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be good with people, obviously. Um, you could be really good at finance, but if you can't talk to people and can't read body language and never get any deeper than, yeah, those Packers are really good, um, you're just not going to get very far. And if you can't connect, if you're not able to connect and build some trust, it doesn't matter how good you are in finance. So the two go together. And that's something that I, I am passionate about because I've seen it myself. Um, we have federal programs. Some of you have heard of EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentive Program. We use that quite a bit. Even though I work for Sauk County, we, if we want to install practices, we don't have as much money as, say, the federal side of things. And so we go, hey, EQIP has oodles of funds. Why don't you go there? Because you're likely to get funded. For it. So like, if, you can, if you're going to convert Oh, like the one I'm working on right now, 470 acres into grazing, fencing all of that, watering all of that, seeding all of that. It's thousands and thousands of dollars. And with cost sharing, it's not that much out of a landowner's pocket. And so they can be in the black pretty quick versus being in the red for a while to try and pay all that off. And so that's why people take it. That's why I advocate for it. If you've got a, a big enough project, it can be costly. And so why not use the cost share dollars um, to do that? Um, 
there's CSP, there's all conservation reserve programs. We as a county, just so happens like in our county, we have we have our own pool of money that we tap into for grazing, for waterways, for all these other things too. And in the state, we also have a pool of money from the state. So it, within our county and Saw County and a lot of counties throughout the state, I would say there's there are three pots of money that we could use to put towards conservation practices. And then there are people that you, as a producer, you don't have to go, you don't have to pay for me to show up at your farm. Like you're already paying for me through your tax dollars. I, I do say that. Why don't you use me? That's what I'm here for. And that's what you hired me for. I don't, I don't give you a $10,000 bill for my technical assistance and support and emotional support sometimes and financial support and running through the numbers. I don't charge you for that. You're already paying for my position. And so use me accordingly. Um, I say it, I'm pretty direct like that sometimes, depending on reading, obviously reading the room and figuring out if that's safe to say. Um, but there are no real cookie cutter approaches to it. Um, practices that work here in Sauk County might not work somewhere in Texas. Um, it's just the geology is different, the rainfall is different, uh, the soils are different. Um, and so this is where finding a local technician or a local conservation person really matters because they they would know the landscape. They would have training on, on all those things. Um, so like if you don't have good mentoring and support, some of these practices can fail like cover crops. If someone's kind of lukewarm about it to begin with, they're not really convinced, convinced, they're willing to try it some. If there's a difficulty, boom, okay, I thought that was dumb, I'm done. I'm out, no more of that, that's crazy talk. Um, and so if you're there and can provide some assistance and mentoring, and oh, let's work through it. Well, I'll, let me talk to Farmer Joe, who will, who learned it from Farmer Bob. I, I can have him come over and you guys can connect. Okay, go ahead. You guys work it out, but don't give up on it. And so sometimes I swear we're cheerleaders more than anything um, too. So this is just a, these are the things that guide me and guide a lot of us in the conservation field as far as like, you know, how, the approach that we use towards our jobs. It's like when a land does well for its owner and the owner does well by his land, when both end up better by reason of their partnership, that's when we have conservation. And, and they both have to do well together financially and obviously ecologically. And when the two marry together, and it's possible, and plenty of farmers, at least that I work with, make that happen. It is possible. It's not mutually exclusive. Um, when we have that good partnership, that's when we have conservation that lasts for a long time and that maybe gets passed on to the next generation. And so I think that's it for me, Marcel. Thank you, Serge. That was, I, I really appreciated you emphasizing that the financial success depends on how it is implemented. And so it really emphasizes that uh, how critical tech, long-term technical support is. Um, so as farm business management educators, I'm hoping folks are starting to think about how you might work with people like Serge and make some real direct connections with them. Uh, at this point, if you have questions, certainly put them in the chat, but let's let's uh, switch over to Sarah Horner to talk about uh, landowner and tenant considerations. And then after she's done, we'll address some uh, questions as time allows for, for both Sarah and Serge. So Sarah, looks like you are sharing your screen just right, thank you. And I'll let you introduce yourself. 
sure. Well, that went a lot smoother for me sharing my screen than it did last week. So um, uh, my name is Sarah Horner. I'm an ag lender with Flanagan State Bank. Um, we're in central Illinois, about 100 miles south of Chicago. Um, I have done this for about five years. I also farm with my dad and uncle, and we are conventional farmers. When this presentation came in, this presentation was originally um, was going to be presented by an attorney, and she had since left the firm. So I kind of got in here at the last minute. Um, I am basically going to be presenting on things that I've added that are just good, uh, very hands-on, practical um, tips for uh, landlord tenant considerations. Then at the very end, I kept all of her legal um, slides in there. If you guys are interested for a lot of that, I will say she's in Arkansas, so some of it might be um, for those states. So with that getting started, hang on one second there. There we go. This is kind of our agenda. We're going to talk about landowner considerations, tenant, the land itself considerations, some types of leases, um, then some tips on leases from some farm managers that I talked to and additional legal info. And just so you know, um, I talked to about three or four different farm managers that we work with on a regular basis that our customers work with and we know that they have experience when it comes to conservation practices and um and organics and you'll hear me talk about organics and i do understand there is a a, a portion of of conservation that doesn't really you know with all the tillage that goes on in organics isn't necessarily consider that completely conservation but i'm going to use it because in the end, you know, there are some soil practices and cover crops that go into those. So you'll hear me talk about that, but in the end, it, it, it all kind of is, is in the same boat. So with that, let's get started. Um, so first of all, if you are a farm manager and you have a client and they want to do, um, they want to do conservation practices, the first thing you're going to do as a farm manager is you're going to say, what is the risk level of my customer, right? Can they afford to do this on their own? Um, the one farm manager gave me the example of a, uh, of like, you know, you have this, you know, little old lady, she's in the nursing home. She needs the income off that field um, for the nursing home payments and everything. And maybe she just has 80 acres. You can't really risk that person's livelihood or them having food on their table and stuff like that. So not every landowner is going to be able to afford to do this, right? Um, or if you if they can, you're gonna have to mitigate those. You're gonna have to make sure that you really um, mitigate those risks as best as possible. Then you have to have commitment, right? So when you have um, when you have uh, a landlord that does wants to do conservation practices, organics, the changes do not happen overnight right? The landlord has to have cons uh, commitment in the long term, right? And I'll mention this later, but you're looking at leases that are at least three to five years. You can't just as a, the landowner can't, you can't have a landowner that just says you got two years to do this, then you're done. It's just not going to work out that way. Um, these things take time. So you have to have a landowner that's committed to it. Um, also the feasibility, you know, there's going to be landowners that are going to want to do things with their land that maybe that land is not meant to do. You cannot do more than what Mother Nature has given you, right? So there are certain climates that are suited to certain practices. There are certain soils that are better for certain cover crops and everything, and you cannot force it, right? Um, I'm in, I'm from Illinois, so we're a very long state. So when you talk to like the University of Illinois Extension team, they will Im immediately ask you, what part of the state are you in? Because Southern Illinois actually has a slightly different climate and very different soil than what I have in Central to Northern Illinois, right? So the conversations are different and you need to be aware of if, if it's even um, an option to do. Um, you know, is there tile in the field? Like for example, if you're gonna do uh, organics, do you have a way to help either conserve water? Does it flood all the time? Like these are things you need to consider when you do it. Are you able to do it? Then you also have uh, control. Is the landowner willing to operate in a shared decision-making process? Because a landowner can say, you know, you can have a landowner say, I want 400 bushels of corn, right? Well, that's not feasible, right? You need to be able to work with your tenant and to give up some of that control. And then you need to decide who's going to be making those decisions, right? Is the tenant going to be leading it 
or is it going to be the landowner and the tenant's just kind of going off what the landowner says, right? So like if you had someone, you have someone like Serge, if he's the landowner, I would let him run the show. And he would, if, if I was his tenant, I would let him say, you know, tell me how high to jump and I would just do it because he knows what's going on, right? So you really have to know who's going to have control into the decision making. Um, and then financial, we also talked about this uh, just a second ago, is the landowner able to adjust the leasing terms? Um, if you're going to go into organics, just know in the transition years, you're either not going to make money or you're going to be break even to very tight profit margins. So you need to make sure that the landowner can afford that. So that then goes back up to the risk level. Can they afford to do that? Um, so the tenant, it's kind of the same thing on the tenant side. What is the tolerance of risk relative to financial reward for the, the tenant? As a farmer, if I had a landlord that says, I want you to do this, the first thing I'm going to think is, okay, can I pay my bills? Can I pay my line of credit? Can I pay my tractor note? That sort of thing. Can I pay my rents on my other field? Or can I pay the rent to you is more important, right? So what risk is the tenant willing to take on? Then you have commitment. I have seen it many times where a landowner will say, I want conservation practices, or um, I want to go organic. And the tenant it's all about the acres. It's not necessarily your bottom line. It's about how many acres do you farm and how big are your yields, especially in central Illinois where I'm at, it's, it's you know land of corn and soybeans. And some of these farmers get into it and they realize they're not up for it, right? And in, in particular with organics, you have people that'll toe the line, but you have to have a commitment to it because it's not gonna be profitable overnight. It is a long-term thing to do conservation practices and then see the, to reap the rewards from those practices. So you have to have a tenant that is in it, right? I, I've seen it where um, I had, I was on a webinar once and a, a landlady once said, well, I would like to do these conservation practices, but my tenant really doesn't want me to. And it's like, at that point, you have to make a decision whether you want to stick with that tenant. You know, I have this saying that if you have a good tenant, let them do their job. Right. And if your tenant isn't following what you want to do as a landowner, then maybe it's time to find a new tenant. But I will say, if you have a good tenant, it's okay if they've never done it and they're learning. That's okay. But you have to have someone that is going to, you know, try their best at it. Resources. Um, does the farmer have labor, equipment, um, time? Uh, does the farmer have livestock for grazing? What are you asking them to do? And do they have what it takes to, to do it? Um, I'll give you an example on my farm. We are, we're not that big, at least for central Illinois standards, we're not that big. And we um, just recently put guidance in our planter tractor and the conversation around cover crops with my dad and uncle, primarily my dad has changed because now we have guidance. So if we were going to plant like cereal rye or something, we can now, we don't have to worry so much about seeing the marker because now we have guidance where we can set an AB line right? If you're going to have organics, the reason, you know, there's a higher profit margin in organics, there's higher risk, but the reason a lot more people don't do, go into organics because it's work. It's about two times the amount of uh, work per acre. So conventional is about two and a half hours per acre. And then organics is about 4.9 hours per acre. Um, so that's why more people don't do it. It's really easy for conventional farmers to go out there you know, you work the ground in the spring, you plant, you spray, you harvest, work it in the fall, go out there again, work it in the spring and just repeat, rinse and repeat over and over again. That is easy. It's very easy to do. Conservation takes time. Um, the, and it, you know, it does take resources. Guidance does help. And having those, that data set really does help as well. Um, experience. Does the farmer have any experience with conservation practices? This one is important, but it's more important to me that they are the type of farmer that if they don't have experience, that they are easy to work with or are okay asking questions. So in my county, we have a really good soil and water person and she is phenomenal. And I have not even done anything with her on my acres and that I rent. And she will take my phone calls every time and answer all my questions. She'll answer my dad's questions. I mean, she, if, as long as you have someone you can ask who does have experience, that's a big deal. That's what, you know, the tenant wants, needs to know these things to be successful. The next thing is a long-term lease. Um, and I talked about this earlier, but does the farmer have a long-term lease to be able to try new, 
practices. Again, you're not going to be able to have a one or two year lease on this. You need to have at least three to five years. And if it were me doing it, and I was, even if I, you know, the landowner someday, I would want five years because that gives that farmer time to, to do trial and error, right? Because maybe one thing doesn't work one year because of weather, but maybe next year it does or something wasn't right, okay? Um, transparency. So this is a big deal to me, not only because I rent ground and I rent ground for my dad, um, but so he knows everything anyway, but also because as a landowner, I would want to know these things. I would want to know what's going on. So you need to, the tenant needs to be able to be transparent with their landowner. And one way you can do that is soil testing. We have a leash right now where we have to do soil tests on a regular basis. Um, so that's something that can create transparency in a lease is if you mandate soil testing, because then you can show that over time, whatever's been working or whatever you've been doing has been working, right? So as a tenant, I would definitely want to do soil testing, right? And I would want the landlord to be in on that as well. So they know what's going on. Um, so justification, if a farmer is requesting conservation practices, they need to be ready to explain to the landowner why are they recommending it. You need to be able to explain to the landowner what are the benefits, benefits to the soil and will it make them money? That last part is very crude and crass, but it is absolutely true. A lot of landowners, we're getting a lot more landowners that are removed from the farm. In other words, maybe their grandparents were on the farm, their parents moved them out of state and they went there every now and then, but they have no emotional connection to the farm, whatever. It's just a paycheck for them, right? That's a, That happens quite a bit. If you can't pay as a tenant, the number one thing you're gonna do if you're short on money is you're gonna pay your landlords first. And then you're going to work out payment plans or, you know, pay your vendors next. And then you're going to work out a payment plan with someone like myself. You're going to talk to the bank about maybe um, restructuring or something. But the first thing a landlord's going to want to know is, is, are you going to be able to pay the bill? So you need to be able to, I would have it in writing. If you have some success stories in the county, I would definitely have some of those ready to go. I would maybe bring in the soil and water folks, like have them talk to them. I don't think that's bad at all. The more people that talk to them, the better. Okay, so land considerations. I talked about this a little bit. Not every acre is, it's not feasible to do it, uh, the same conservation plan on every acre, right? You need to make sure that you have a farm that is conducive to this. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have a lease right now with a landowner, and then there's another farmer that also has a lease with this landowner, but they farm organically. The farm they farm is, um, it's well drained, it's not near, you know, it's good soil, everything, it doesn't flood, it's really good ground, it's very good for organic. The ground that we farm for that landlord is right near timber, it's not great soil, it's floods, if the river floods, then it floods, you know, it's just not going to be very good for organics and trying to keep weeds down and everything. Keep that in mind, and, and like I mentioned, Something that works up in Wisconsin, Minnesota may not work in Illinois. I had one of the farmer, farm managers tell me, you know, down here we can grow wheat in central Illinois and south, but you get to northern Illinois and into Iowa, he said it's most likely going to be oats, right? Things change. So you have to make sure that what you're wanting to do is feasible for the ground, the soil, and the climate that you have in that area. Um, that goes into, again, the, the current state of the ground. You need to know your starting point, right? Because how are you supposed to know what you need in that soil if you don't know where you're at? And also you cannot check to see how far you've come unless you have those values. So running those soil tests is very important. Don't go into it fly, uh, just flying blind. You know, just make sure you know where you're at and what you need in that soil and what cover crops or what practices, um, whether it be no-till or whatever, you can do for it. Um, drainage, like I just mentioned, drainage is an issue. Um, you need to know what the drainage is because that could also determine what you do. Is no-till even an option for you in that area? Um, let's see, weeds. So knowing kind of what weeds are in the soil is a big deal. There's a gentleman and I cannot remember his name off the top of my head, but I can maybe send a link to um, you all that for his book. He's got a book and it literally says, if you have this weed, that you have too much of this in your soil or you don't have enough nitrogen in your soil or something like that. He literally wrote a book and there's this huge chart and it basically, and he, I think it's called like 
what we, when weeds talk, I think is what it's called. But he basically says, weeds tell a story and weeds do tell a story. Weeds will tell you kind of what is going on in the soil as well. So pay attention to what weeds are out there because they're speaking to you, right? Okay, so we're gonna talk real, qu real quick um, about the cash rent um, share, crop share and hybrid leases. This is from the original attorney that put it together, but I think it's really good to talk about just basically what I what we see on our end, um, at least in central Illinois for these leases. And I think you're seeing them throughout the Midwest and all over as well. Um, so first of all, you have the cash rent, um, oops, sorry, the cash rent lease. You're seeing this more and more because like I mentioned, you have generations that are so far removed from the farm. They don't wanna have to worry about anything but cashing a check. So basically it's going to, you're going to say, Hey, it's $300 a year flat done. These are getting very high. And I can tell you in the area where I am sitting right now, which is just out just in between Bloomington Normal and Champaign, Illinois, there are leases that are like $600 an acre. I'm not sure how those farmers make money on those farms, but again, it goes back to, they want more acres, right? Um, they're getting out of, some of them are getting out of control. If you have a fair lease as a landowner, then you're going to have a tenant that's going to treat you well and treat the soil well. If a, if a tenant doesn't have the money for something, they're most likely going to, you know, skimp on the fertilizer. So I'll give you this example. We have a neighbor, um, he owns some land and another neighbor, neighbor of ours went and said, hey, I would like to rent your ground. Well, he knew that was too much money and he knew that he was going to skimp on the fertilizer. So the landowner said, I'm going to pay the fertilizer bill and you're going to reimburse me. And that's how he knows the fertilizer goes on is he orders the fertilizer and he puts it on. So be very wary of this. If you are a farm manager and you are having, uh, you have customers coming in saying, I want 500 an acre, stuff like that. You just need to remember what's feasible in the area and what you're wanting out of it in the end, because you could be basically taking things out of that soil that are going to take years to put back into it. So, um, like we said, you you have no say in the, how the farmer is farming on this. You have to decide when rent is due. Some people do half in the spring, half in the fall. You know, it, you need to know when that's that all needs to be in writing. All these things need to be in writing at this point. Um, some leases have in there that the landlord or the farm management company will get part of the crop insurance money, and the reason they do that is to make sure they get paid their rent. Okay. So if you are a farmer, you need to think, can I afford this rent? What's my go to heck plan if, you know, prices crash or there's a drought or something. Um, so that needs to kind of be in play there. And that needs to be in the lease. What happens again, all this stuff, you really need to put it on in writing. Um, if I was a landlord, I absolutely would require my tenants to have crop insurance, especially if it's cash rent, straight cash rent. I would. Maybe not every farm manager would do that, but it really would, I would need to know the circumstances of the farmer and know they were financially able to pay all their cash rents because in all likelihood, if they're not able to pay mine, they're not able to pay others. So but that insurance is a safety net there. Um, it's kind of the same thing, the landlord taking, basically putting their names on the checks type things. So, um, so yeah, again, you need to be wary of these in the sense that they need to be fair. And I will say too, we have some that are fixed cash rents, but when we do well, we give the, the landlord more money. And, and the reason behind that is, is we want to share in our victories because we know they're keeping it low for tighter years, right? And that's more of what we call a flex lease. And, but that's an unofficial one we don't have in writing. A flex lease is basically you have a base cash rent and then there's a calculation that goes in like net profit on the farm or whatever you pay X amount above what you make or so, or what you make, you they get like 20% of their net profit on it or something, but they get a bonus in it. If, so when you do well, they do well, right? So that's a, that's a nice hybrid to have between what we're about to talk, which is the, the crop share lease. Um, in all honesty, this is probably the most, this is the fairest of all the leases. It is also probably the one that's going away the fastest because basically, um, I'm just going to call it a 50-50. You're paying half of everything. They're paying half of everything. You market half the grain. They market half the grain. They have to get crop insurance. So, you know, it really, it's just going away because there's people that don't want to mess with 
um, marketing and everything. I will say a hybrid of this though, and we are doing this for the first time in one of our fields is um, a net profit share basically. So it's basically the landowner said to us, market your grain, take an average over the year and forever how many bushels, then subtract, that's your income and then subtract out your expenses and your net profit, we want half. And that's like a 50-50 lease without them having to market or do any of the stuff they don't want to do as far as the business side and everything. So, you know, it, it, you, these would, used to be a lot more common and they are the fairest. I mean, in all honesty, if I ever was, am a landowner someday, I probably would do this because it means I'm sharing and everything with the farmer. I'm invested just as much as they are in what they're doing. Okay. Um, yeah. So here's some issues that come up you know, maybe they're not doing something you want to do. So if you want to do those conservation practices, but they're spending money on things that you don't want to spend on, that's an issue, right? Um, you need to know and have it in writing exactly what's going to happen. Whenever we decide whether to put fertilizer on or if we're going to do no-till or what, or if we have to, or if we can't do no-till one year, we always tell the farm manager on these 50-50 leases because they need to know. And they need to know on behalf of the um, landowner. So these, you, there has to be a really good line of communication between the landowner and the tenant with these leases. Um, and again, here's the hybrid. Hybrids come in different um, forms. I'm gonna grab a drink quicker. You, you can do a lot of different things with them. Like I said, you could do a 50-50 on the net profit of a field. You can do a flex lease, which again, are becoming very common, very common. And you have that base rent so they know exactly what they're getting minimum. And then there's a calculation on the back end to figure out how much extra they get. But if you have clients that have a base rent and it's a fair base rent and you have really, really good years, like the last two years in Illinois and I think around the Midwest have been two of the best years in the last 50 years, I highly recommend you give your landowner a, a bonus anyway because they're less likely to raise that rent during the, the hard times. Okay, so make sure you're sharing um, as much as you can if you are a tenant or if you're a farm manager representing farmers or anything like that. So, uh, okay. So these are some tips on leases from the farm managers I talked to. Again, um, two of them are brothers. They own uh, farm management, have done it for about 30, 40 years. Um, another one, he is, his, his name is Rob and he's got land all over Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, into Iowa. Um, he does a lot with organics and conservation. And the other one was Haley. Haley does the farm management for the organics and conservation for one down here in central Illinois. But then she also works for the company, um, the Bill Gates company that's uh, working here in Illinois. Um, okay, so who pays? So if the landowner wants cover crops, then they should expect to reimburse for the cover crops and actual costs. If the tenant wants to do it, then it's the tenant's expense. This is just a good way to start off the relationship, right? So the farmer is taking the risk as a landowner. If I was saying, I want you to do these things and they're you're asking them to take on more expenses, I would be prepared to pay a little bit of it, if not all of it, right? I've said this a number of times, the length of the lease is a big deal. These things don't happen overnight. You're gonna need to have three to five year leases and I would, and I would lean towards that five-year lease. Give them time to do things trial and error, right? Um, type of leases. If the landowner is requesting change in farming practices, going to a 50-50 crop share lease will show the tenant that you're serious about it, right? Especially if you're going like organics and they're going to, you know, they're going to make less income in the transition years or whatever. You're sharing in that. You're showing your tenant, I'm serious about this. I'm in it for the good and the bad. I'm here right here with you. So if you were talking to a landowner and at the end of the day, conservation practices are completely up to the landowner. If they want them, they get them. You, I, I would as a landowner, I would go 50-50 because it really does show that you have faith in your farmer and that you're in it with them, right? Okay, so you're not just paying them that $300 cash rent or whatever, and they're not just cashing your check. You're in it, good or bad. Um, language. This is very important. I mean, you need to have either call a lawyer, call a farm manager. You need to have it very clear what you want to be done. When are payments going to be made? What kind of um, conservation practices do you want? Um, if it's a crop share, then, you know, there's no reason not for them not to be done, right? Because they're sharing in it. Uh, CRP. 
So CRP is kind of uh, more than one of the uh, farm managers said organics and CRP are the buzzwords with their landowner clients. And um, the landowner gets all the payments for the CRP. Um, they do pay some to the tenant if there's maybe some mowing or something that goes along as far as keeping up the land. Um, but then there's some cases where this, the farm the landowner is not eligible for the payments and sometimes they'll run it through the farmer tenant as a pass through and the farmer basically gets that money, gives it right to the landowner and then gives them a 1099 at the end of the year. Um, the one thing a couple of them recommended is to have someone you know, advocate for the acres that could qualify basically because landowners probably don't speak to the USDA on a regular basis. So if you have a farm manager, they're gonna be familiar with the USDA. If it's a landowner without a farm manager, then having that farmer tenant there has someone that already has a relationship with the local USDA office. And so having them be a part of the CRP is a really good idea because then you have someone that speaks their language, you know, that understands them. Um, so I had, you know, have someone that is going to advocate for those acres and is able to bridge the gap between the landowner and, and the USDA. Um, know the quality of the farm. This also, again, needs to be in the lease. Do soil tests um, to know what's needed. Everybody should do these. I mean, on a, on a regular basis, you should do it. And so you know where your soil is at and what you need in it. Um, changes. Okay, so this came up more than once is, I think all four of them said something along the lines of if there's going to be changes, to a lease when it comes to conservation or organics, they tend to wait till the current tenant retires. The reason being is at some point in your career, they're not gonna want to make these changes, right? It's very, it's a lot easier to get younger the younger generation of farmers to pick up these conservation practices. So if you have a change in tenant coming up or you know of a farmer who is going to retire soon, that is the time to talk to the next farmer and say, hey, have you thought about conservation practices, right? And sometimes they're gonna, it's gonna be a hard no, but it's gonna be a different conversation, I would say, probably a little bit more open. Um, it's also a talk, talk among the farmer, you know, among my friends, who are all farmers actually, about, um, you know, is the government gonna make us do some of this stuff? So it's, there's a conversations that go along with this stuff and younger generations, without their hands being forced necessarily, tend to be more open. There's always gonna be those that are not gonna do it unless you make them, but the younger generations are more open to it. They also are more in tune to the technology. So when it comes to guidance um, and data on the farms, they're probably a little bit more well-versed in it as well. Um, and so I think they just feel a bit more comfortable uh, going on about that. I will say that um, talking to like my dad and uncle, you know, they remember what it was like walking those beans when they were younger and they've seen it when cover crops have gotten away from farmers. And, you know, I just had a situation where somebody planted hairy vetch and they were gonna plant organic corn and then they couldn't plant the organic corn because they couldn't get the planter to go through it. Um, so it kind of changed what they were planting this year and everything. So they hear the horror stories. The coffee shops are really good for the horror stories. The success stories are harder to find. So you just kind of have to, you have to find the people that have done it successful in their area. But again, if, if you see a change in farmer, that's the time to address these things. Um, with that, I promised them I would end about five minutes early and about five minutes early for any questions. These are the names of the farm managers that I talked to. I highly recommend you call them if you have any questions that I don't answer, or if you feel like I didn't cover something, be like, hey, can you elaborate on this that Sarah said? Um, Rob's really good. Like I said, Rick and Russ have had been in there for 30, 40 years, and then Haley as well is fantastic. And they've all written articles for us for our organic newsletter. And I believe that Marcel has shared those in the agenda. So they're all on our website. Go look up those. Um, um, those newsletters, if you want to read their full articles, and if they write anything in the future, you can join that email list for free. And we only send it out three or four times a year, um, but we usually do try to have something on cover crops and, and everything um, like that on, on those newsletters. So, rushing through that, is there any questions? Yeah, that's great, Sarah. And yeah, uh, also the links to Sarah's slides are, are in the agenda, so check that out. And while we're taking questions, if you would put them in the chat, uh, but uh, Jenny, if you could share, we had one more poll question. Uh, we're just wondering how many of you are dealing with these issues with the, the farmers that you're advising on some of these rental contract questions.
while you guys are doing that too, before I forget, um, we just put out a book that was written by people in the industry, not by the bankers. No one wants to hear from us, but it's free. So if anybody wants a free copy of that book, email me and I will mail it to you. It's got stuff on there on general ag, mental health. There's some conservation things in there. There's articles about transitioning to organic, but not only that, it's got the contact information of those folks so that you can reach out to them directly if you had a question on what they wrote in the book. So um, again, that's free. You know, we just mail them out. So if you're interested, just let me know and I'll send them out to you. No problem. On Wednesday, Vincent Gautier from EDF will be talking about some new economic data that they've compiled uh, about cover crops, the economics of cover crops and some other practices. And Paul Dietman from Compere Financial will be talking as well. Uh, I want to say a thanks to, uh, there's some people out there from uh, Texas, California, Massachusetts, all of you are coming from other parts of the country. Really interested to hear reactions from all of you uh, about the content of this, uh, these webinars. Uh, it's honestly, this is does have a Midwestern bias. Uh, so we'll be interested if it um, also how useful it is or what you would need for this to be useful in other parts of the country as well. Any questions out there for either Serge or uh, for Sarah? Hearing none, I guess we'll, uh, we'll see you all on Wednesday for part two.